Hey guys, welcome back to the Mind Yourself podcast. Um, it's myself, Owen, here again, um, doing another interview session with a very interesting guest. So to start off, uh, where do I start? So when people kind of think born winner, and it's an often overused term when it comes to sport, but I think when my next guest, um, they fit this profile perfectly. So growing up and competing as a Gaelic football player, a soccer player, a rugby player, Achievements and successes have always followed her. From winning club football championships to representing her country, she is the perfect role model for any aspiring sports person. On top of this, after her own mental health battles, she has looked to be an ambassador for mental health awareness through her work with Pieta House and the Tackle Your Feelings campaign. She has been selected to represent Ireland in the 2021 Women's Six Nations Championship and all of this on top of her day job as a teacher. I think it's safe to say she is more than succeeding in life. So without further ado, I am delighted to be joined by Hannah Tyrrell. How are you, Hannah? I'm good. Thanks, Owen. Thanks for having me on. Very good. Very good. So, Hannah, just to start off, obviously, um, some people may know your background in sport. I know it's uh, it's widely spoken about all the different sports and eclectic yeah. mix of sports that you've uh, you've taken part in but do you want to give a bit of background and just your sporting background where that all came from how you've gotten into a kind of sport and all the different kind of paths you took in that space yeah of course um i suppose growing up i was um i had two best friends and they were both boys and they're very active and um my first sport that i played um was soccer uh, or football that was you know encouraged by those uh, two friends of mine to go down and join a local club and um, and yeah I went down and joined Monksfield United like a very very small club uh, in my area and started playing soccer there with the boys uh, being the only girl on the team and um, I loved it I loved um, playing it I was a a Man United fan you know to the core and um, nice. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was it was just when I fell in love with sport, and I only played soccer for um, a few years then before moving on to playing GAA um, with a club uh, Round Towers in Clondalkin in my hometown. And um, I moved away from soccer just because um, I had to go and find a girls' team, but there was actually none around in my area, so I I couldn't play with the boys um, at Monksfield anymore, and um, just due to size and, and mm. kind of physical differences that were happening so I started playing GAA yeah when I was about 12 or 13 with Round Towers and Clondalkin and from there I managed to um, make my way onto the the Dublin county team um, and ended up having a very successful career there for the for about 10 years or so uh, underage right up to senior Um, and I was very, very lucky to be on some very successful squads with some unbelievably talented players. And, um, you know, we won a couple of All-Irelands um, throughout the years. And yeah, I played I played GA up until I was about 23 when rugby kind of fell into my path. And um, as I said, very late comer to rugby. And I only started playing rugby because a friend of mine who I knew through GA thought that, you know, I'd be a really good rugby player. And invited me down to Old Belvedere and uh, rugby club for some training and that season it didn't clash with my GA training so I went down and I fell in love with it and you know it's been it's been a crazy few years and I never really thought that this would be the path that my life would take but um, you know I'm very lucky I suppose I played lots of different sports I dabbled in basketball I played a little bit of camogie I did athletics at a young age as well but for me team sports um, have always been something that I've been drawn to and I've been very lucky to be on some successful squads and, you know, I've been lucky enough to be able to make a career out of it. Mm, mm. So, I mean, and did you find that transition from one sport to another? Like, obviously, the soccer to the football, uh, the GAA was, you know, maybe a very different skill set. Maybe the rugby was a little bit easier because some of those skill sets, but then obviously different ball, different rules. How, How did you find that or was it just kind of, you know, just got stuck in? Yeah, for me, I kind of just threw myself into it. I, I'm very lucky. GAA seemed to come very naturally to me. Um, you know, soccer, I had to work at it a little bit. It wasn't very good at the start, and, and I really had to work at that, but I really wanted to. And mm-hmm. um, as you can hear, my dog's in the background. The post has there just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies. No worries. Um, but yeah, so I think from soccer to GAA was 
was quite easy for me. Um, I, and God, I sound like I'm bragging there, but I, it felt very natural for me and, and fluid. GA to rugby, again, there were some aspects that I found really, really easy. And um, mm-hmm. I suppose for me, what I had in my head when I joined rugby was just run away from everybody, just get the ball and run away from people and see what happens, you know. And essentially, that's the aim of the game, you know, avoid mm-hmm. people. Um, but the contact side of rugby was a, a challenge, you know, and still is a challenge for me. I feel like I'm always learning and, you know, and always trying to improve, particularly my contact skills, because that wasn't something I had done before. But for me, I saw it as a challenge and as a way to improve and, and see how good I could be. And mm. um, yeah, it's worked out all right. Yeah, <laughs> it worked yeah. out all right is an understatement, I'd say. But I mean, it's interesting because, you know, obviously, e- e- even myself, I-, I-, I have a huge kind of sporting background and interest. It's nice to kind of see how you've kind of gone through various different sports. Mine was always GA. I never, I'm interested in every sport, but I never played anything else. Um, but and did you come from a very sporting family? Was there a lot of push, or was it just you, no. your friends, and kind of no? <laughs> yeah, no. Like my dad was mad uh, into soccer. He's big Leeds United fan and stuff. But like it wasn't. We're we're not a GAA family. Um, okay. you know, I have two older sisters who. You know, they played a bit of sport, but it was never their thing, you know, Mm. Um, and I have a younger sister and a younger brother. My younger brother has got into sport, but I think that's because of me. And so I didn't really come from a massive sporting family. They were very supportive and brought me to all the trainings I needed. But, you know, it wasn't my dad who was like, let's go down and and join the local soccer team or join join the local GA team. That was me Mm. wanting to get out there and wanted to play. I never really wanted to be in the house when I was, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, yeah. It's it is interesting, I suppose. I mean, you know how you know you that's kind of self self driven in a sense, and maybe maybe that's maybe that's an aspect of how you've been able to kind of maintain success across different sports is that you weren't ever looking for someone else to kind of encourage you. It was always internal. Yeah, I suppose. I actually never really thought about it like that. But um, yeah, like, I, I don't know, I guess, I suppose my house is always very busy. You know, there was always five children in there and there's always lots going on. And I was just always drawn to sports. If I wasn't, you know, actually at an organized training session, I was out playing heads and volleys with the lads on the road, you know, or I was out playing tip the can or um, watching sports, whatever else, you know, and just my whole life just revolved around sports because I loved it so much and it didn't matter really what sport I was watching, you know, or, or learning or playing. Mm. I just loved doing it. And so did you like, obviously, as you said, your background or your interest growing up was always in the soccer as a United fan. I'm also a United fan, so I can share that passion. <laughs> but did you, did you, when you went into GA and when you went into rugby, had you any exposure to watching those sports, being aware of them or, or, or was that kind of your first step into kind of learning about them it was pretty similar for both so I, I had a little background of GA and um, I'd been to one or two matches because my aunt actually was going out and won the Dublin footballers um, during the 1995 season so I'd kind of a little background but it wasn't a big thing uh, like mm. for us and then it was the same with the rugby we'd my, my nana was mad into watching um, the Irish rugby matches but we never like it was never a priority that the match is on we have yeah. to sit down and watch the kind of thing so I'd watched the bits I'd watched the women win the 2013 um, Grand Slam um, and I, I suppose that's kind of where my interest peaked a little bit but you know I wasn't I wasn't as mad into it as I am now <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, would you say now as a spectator as well your interest in these sports has improved having taken part in them yeah, definitely. Like now I'm very keen, um, I suppose, supporter of rugby and I watch, I'd watch any rugby match, to be honest. I just love watching it, love watching how teams play and soccer, I find a little bit harder to watch now that rugby is so much more interesting. I love playing <laughs> soccer, but For watching sure. it's a lot harder, particularly with United and their recent results and all that, but... And um, yeah, I, I just love watching sports. I watch mm. the most random of sports that are on telly half the time. I, I love watching or re watching games, and it, it's just sports is just something that I've always been drawn to, and it's always given me pleasure to watch and play and just sh- watch people showcase the amazing athletic ability that they have. Of course, of course. And so I suppose, um, 
you've talked about you know some of your successes and uh, successes and when i was looking back um you know through some of your achievements like you know it's almost like you know you couldn't not win it was like everything underage yeah. football um with your fai cup with the soccer then going into rugby and you have huge successes both playing on a world stage with the sevens then going into 15s a lot of people always talk about how you know you try you know sport even today has become so much more competitive but so much more intense at every level and i'm sure um with uh women's sport as well getting a much bigger audience you know yeah. the intensity has gotten better how was it like obviously you said there was that little bit of transition period where ga and rugby didn't coincide too much did you ever have a point where trying to balance everything was just too much or did you tend to just kind of move from one to the other without kind of having to play too much at one time when I actually first started playing rugby, I started playing rugby in October 2013 and it was very much just playing club rugby with all Belvedere. And for me, it was like kind of a social thing. It was off season for GAA, you know, and it didn't clash. So I was like, I have a bit of crack here. I played with the second team. It was, you know, it was, it was just going to be something to try, but never going to be. I never thought it would replace um, GA for me and replace my my kind of passion with with the county squad. Um, but the next year in 2014, I was with the Dublin senior squad and we were playing in the National League and we'd reached National League final. But about a month before that, I'd been contacted by uh, the Irish Women's Seven squad to come in and start training with them. And basically... Um, I kind of did them both in secret without letting the other really know. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then it basically came to a head where I was offered a contract with the Irish women's sevens team and offered to basically go on my first tournament, to potentially make my debut around the same uh, weekend that Dublin were playing in the national league final. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a clash there and a decision to make, but basically with rugby, what they were offering was, um, a contract which would mean it would become my job um, mm. and with that I would have to give up GA and soccer and any other kind of sports and whatever else and at the time it was huge turmoil because rugby was something relatively new for me I never thought that you know a contract and potentially a career was something that I could get from that yeah and Southern GA had been playing for so long I, wa I was you know trying to reach the pinnacle of an All-Ireland final um, with with the dubs and I was kind of caught in the crossroads, um, but for me, I, I chose rugby um, at that point in my career because I was still quite young. You were 80 at the time? I was 24. Okay, that's a big choice uh, yeah. to make at well, 24. Actually, not even, yeah, yeah, 24, 24. Um, and no, even 24, 23 actually. And um, I just didn't know if an opportunity like that would come around again, you know, to train in a professional environment, get paid, travel the world, potentially go to an Olympics, you know. And for me, obviously back then, I didn't think that that would span for six or seven years. You know, I thought, oh, I'll do yeah. it this year and see how we go. It doesn't work. Come back to Dublin, you know, and and go for it again at plenty of time. And so I chose rugby um, and it lasted seven years. Like, you know, it could have lasted longer. Obviously, I chose to retire from sevens last year, but... It, it was just something I never could have imagined. Um, and for me growing up, I didn't have an opportunity. I didn't think there was an opportunity I could ever be a professional sportswoman um, mm. or professional as it was. And so I kind of grasped it with two hands and it was really hard. It was a really difficult time for me making that decision. And, you know, there are like, in some ways I do have regrets. Uh, but at the time, I didn't think I had that choice. I didn't think that opportunity would be there if I said no first time around. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I took it and, and here we are. And yeah. you know, for me, I still believe and hope that if my body allows me that when my rugby career or my international rugby career comes to an end, that I could potentially um, go back to Gaelic football and if they'd have me, get back on the Dublin senior team and, and search for that All-Ireland. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a crazy thing because obviously, I suppose, as you said, you grew up playing sport as a hobby but obviously as a huge interest to get out of the house to go and do things yeah. and then to suddenly have to make it a sort of a career decision on sport is something that you know obviously a lot of people you know dream of but very few people ever get the opportunity to make a call on that and I suppose there's an, an element of stress and pressure in that and it probably puts sport into a, a a frame that never would have been before sports are always obviously that release that 
enjoyment factor, but suddenly now it's a life and career factor. Did that make it more difficult or did you always be able to maintain that kind of enjoyment aspect of the sport? Oh, no, there was definitely a lot of pressure that came with that. Like, you know, it, it wasn't just something I was doing for fun anymore. I had made a commitment. You know, I had signed a contract. I was like, I suppose I was given an opportunity to train and play in this semi-professional environment. And I had to nearly prove that I was worth that contract I was given. So there is pressure and stress on that. But I, I really was enjoying my rugby that I was playing at the time, you know, and there was a lot of stress when I did have to make that decision of, of what route I was going to take. Was I going to stay with GA or, or, you know, move forward with the rugby? And But once I'd made that decision, I suppose, and I had my full focus, and um, while the pressure is there, like the, the pressure is always going to be there. Uh, whether you're playing with GA and not getting paid or whether you're playing, um, you know, rugby for Ireland and you are getting an allowance, there is always pressure to perform and everything else. So it kind of just take it in your stride. But there was a couple of weeks of stress and tension and like, oh God, what's ahead of me here? And did you have to lean on anyone for advice? Obviously talking to probably senior players, family, that kind of thing. Yeah. Look, it was difficult. They had to have a lot of difficult conversations, obviously, because, you know, it, I, it wasn't a decision I wanted to make lightly. Um, mm. And I suppose I had to talk to, I had to try and explain my situation to my teammates, my Dublin teammates, who I was kind of leaving in the lurch a little bit. Um, you know, I, I had to chat to my family about this, who were kind of like, what do you mean? Like rugby could be a career for you. You Like yeah. what? <laughs> you know, that was very out of the blue for them. And, you know, but yeah, look, my friends, uh, my, my uh, fiance were, amazing in that and kind of just I suppose spelling out the pros and cons and really having a look at it and the biggest thing for me was that like Dublin GA wasn't going anywhere you know mm. I, I could always try it and come back mm. and see you know and, and like for me as I said that is still the plan for me it's just been spread out a little longer yeah. than was, you know of course and yeah uh, you're always I mean yeah I mean it, it's something that you know anyone involved in sport I don't think it matters whether you're an amateur sports player, a professional sports player, whether you're playing a national sport like GA or an international sport, I think the opportunity to represent your country in any capacity, I think is yeah. something that everyone would struggle with. And a lot of people would love to have the choice. I mean, I think it's just, you know, it just so happened that in your case, you happen to be pretty good at so many different yeah. things that the challenge is a little bit easier. I suppose sometimes people commit to, you know, rugby say at a young age and they go up through the ranks and, mm. um, What's funny is how, you know, as you said, you even only picked up GA at 13, which is late, I think, in general. And then you only picked up rugby even later than that. So the fact yeah. that, you know, it all kind of just happens like that may, probably made it a little bit more challenging. So I suppose kind of maybe just switching gears a little bit and obviously kind of the theme of what this podcast is about is, a, is all around kind of mental health and things like that. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, investigate a little bit further is your experiences with mental health and the challenges that that you had your your own challenges and whether or not some of these pressures that sport put under you know enhanced you know those experiences and made them worse you know that'd be something just interesting to kind of see your opinion on yeah so uh, for me outside of sport um i from a young age of about 12 or 13 around the time i kind of started playing ga i um I suppose I really suffered with my my self esteem and my self worth and um my confidence in myself and my own abilities and looks and everything else and I I kind of wanted to change how I felt and how I looked and I ended up um develop uh, developing an eating disorder in the form of bulimia um and I also then began to self harm and these two were kind of intertwined and interlinked with each other and um, throughout my teenage years. Um, and for me, I suppose looking back, they were kind of methods of self-control. There was a, you know, I had a lot going on. I had a very busy life with, with um, sport. I was always, my biggest problem was that I was an overachiever and I set myself these mm -hmm hugely unrealistic targets both in sport and school you know in life in general and I never was able to hit these targets and um, you know and so I, was, I constantly felt like I was a failure and, and I wanted to change that and 
felt like, you know, if I lost weight, you know, I would be um, better at sport. I'd be quicker. I'd be smarter. You know, I'd have more friends. I'd be prettier. And I suppose where the self-harm tied in there was that, you know, if I felt like I hadn't done something right or I hadn't achieved those goals, and the self-harm became like a form of punishment for me um, where, you know, I needed to hurt myself to kind of relieve that pain and suffering. And then I could kind of start afresh and start again um, with that. And the self-harm is an unusual one for people to kind of get their heads around. But for me, it was it was something I had to do. It was this overwhelming feeling of hatred and shame and just annoyance at myself for the inability to reach those targets which were unrealistic in the first place so I was always setting myself up for failure but and um, after I would self-harm I would kind of feel like I had punished myself enough and that we could start again and I would try again to be better the next day or whatever else and I got stuck in that cycle um, of the eating disorder and the self-harm and constantly failing and, and hurting myself and punishing yeah. myself for that and for me like from the outside people life was really good for me like as you mentioned I was on some very successful squads with GAA and you know I was doing really really well and I had loads of friends I was doing well in school I was a good student and um, but that was kind of all a facade and on, on the inside I was deeply unhappy about myself and what my life was like and the only way I knew how to control that was through my eating and through my, my self-harm. Um, and that's the route I took. And I, I hid that away from people. You know, I put on that whole that mask and life is great and I'm great. And I was funny and laughing and joking. But on the inside, you know, my life was pretty miserable. And um, I, I just took some very negative coping methods to try and get through it. And... Um, and I didn't tell anybody. I completely isolated myself and, you know, I kind of lost interest in a lot of things and sport being the only thing that I really kept up, you know, and even then there were days when I really didn't want to go and train. But for me, sport was the one thing that I could go off for an hour and and just forget about all the negativity in my head. And I, I wasn't going out to lose weight or burn calories or whatever else I was doing it because I genuinely enjoyed it and I always had enjoyed it and Mm -hmm. you know I was able to just go play the sport that I loved interact with people that I'd probably withdrawn and distanced myself from and just enjoy that peace and that freedom for that one hour Um, Mm -hmm. and for me sport was a lifesaver and during my teenage years It, it really really was and I don't know don't know what I would have done without it to be honest mm. really yeah don't. that was that was what I was was going to ask like it, it's you know did you see sport looking back did you think it was do you think the success of the sport and the pressures the sport put under outweighed the benefits that the sport the sport offered to kind of get away from those kind of negative thoughts or did, did it was there two sides to it really no, like for me I suppose as a young teenager, um, you know, we, it was mostly Dublin GAA I was playing with and, and my club around Harris. And the only pressure I really felt was just turning up for training. Like, you know, that whole, you've made a commitment, you need to go to training. And even on the days when I really didn't want to, that was kind of the pull that got me there. And once I got there, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, it, it was it was brilliant. It was the, the only pressure I genuinely felt was to get there. I was a goalkeeper at the time, so, you know, I didn't need to have massive energy levels, um, you know, or to be properly fueled. So I kind of got away with things with that, um, re- with regards to my eating disorder, I suppose. But other than that, I, I, I really didn't feel much pressure about it. I was still doing it because I loved it. It was just there were days when I really didn't want to go training that I went and I'm glad I did go, you know, and it did make that day a little bit more bearable, a little bit better. Yeah. Mm. And how how did that journey that you personally took throughout that kind of mental struggle from those kind of negative coping mechanisms to eventually coming to terms with it? Did did did, did you get it sorted through your teens or how did that develop? Did it come back again? Like how did you eventually kind of get a grip on it? Yeah, so to be honest, I, I struggled uh, pretty badly um right throughout my teenage years and um, kind of culminating in um 
a suicide attempt in my late teens when I was in sixth year. And um, I suppose that's when it kind of came to a head for me and my family and friends and sport and everything kind of stopped, I suppose, for for a while because um, up to then, none of my teammates knew what I had been struggling with. None of my family knew. I'd completely kept it all to myself and let it build up and build up until it got to a point where I felt like I, I didn't want to be in this world anymore. I didn't. I couldn't cope with all the struggles I was going through and I opted uh, to try and end my life that way. But when it didn't, um, when it didn't work, it obviously came out that I was struggling with this. My family knew, friends began to know, teammates uh, began to learn of what was going on and uh, I entered some treatment facilities and it was kind of then when I suppose the first steps for me to recovery um, were taken and that was when I was about 19 but I probably couldn't say that I was fully recovered till I was about 23 or so um, mm. and it, it was very much a difficult journey because there was times when it, it's, it's, it's hard to explain but like there were times when I really didn't want to recover and um, because the eating disorder and the self-harm for me had become such a crutch in my life that I was really afraid to let it go. And there was other times where I was so sick and tired of what I was going through that, you know, I I I, I wanted to be recovered already. You know, I, I couldn't ask for any more help. And my friends and family were amazing because one of the reasons why I didn't reach out when I was a young teenager was because of the stigma, obviously, that is surrounding mental health. And But I was also afraid that, I was so broken that I couldn't be fixed, you know, and that if I reached out for help and people tried and then failed, then like, well, what then? You know, is this going mm. to be my life forever? And that was something that was, it was something I couldn't even fathom and I didn't want to think about because I I was so miserable. So I, I kind of kept it to myself and, and, and didn't ask and reach out for help. But when I, when everybody, I suppose, did know what was going on, I, my friends in particular my it was the teammates I'd made through sport were there to reach out and ask for help and trying to do everything they could um to help me and I suppose I kind of responded by reaching out and talking to them and letting them help me through my own journey of recovery and it was a lot of you know two steps forward one step back and a couple of relapses here and there but I eventually I suppose got to a place where I was very happy with my own body, my own self-worth, you know, I began to grow in confidence. I began to have a bit of hope for the future and that, you know, life doesn't always have to be like this. Um, and yeah, I, I began to love myself, which I think has been the biggest um, and most positive outcome of all of this. You know, I've realized that I'm not perfect and never will be perfect. And that those standards I had set myself when I was a young teenager were never realistic for me and I, I was just setting myself up for failure over and over again you know mm. and I mean do you now that you're kind of at the other side of it and have a, a much more healthy way of managing your mental health do you reflect on like those times around you know maybe the suicide attempt or some of those really low moments or is that something you just try to kind of move on from or is it something you still think about you know because obviously those particularly at those real peak moments you know the suicide attempt things of like that I'm sure they're difficult things to just think back on given how much you know you've come on since then yeah look um I suppose because I'm so open about uh talking about my mental health it definitely like comes into my head and I suppose when I think about them, I'm just so very grateful that I wasn't successful, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that I'm still alive here today to be able to talk about it. And I, when I do think about it as well, I suppose I think about the turmoil that I I put through my parents, you know, and, and that's something that is something that I find very hard to uh, I have a lot of guilt, I suppose, over that, over putting them through that. And I know I couldn't help myself at the time. I really felt like it was the only option. But, you know, it, it's hard not to think about what I put my parents through on that. And that would be a big regret that I do have. But mm. for me, as I said, I'm very glad it didn't happen. And I'm able to kind of look back over that whole period of time as, yeah, it was a very negative time in my life. But it was something I was able to overcome. and you know, it shows the strength and resilience that I have and I've now built up and 
I'm very confident that if I was to encounter uh, such negative things, you know, ahead or problems ahead or whatever comes my way, that I'm in a position where I know I wouldn't fall back into that state and that I would have the tools and and mm-hmm. positive coping methods to be able to help uh, help myself and reach out and ask for help sooner. For sure, for sure. And um, so, yeah, so you talk about, and it's very clear that the sport, the, the, the kind of the network of friends that you've built up through sport gave you a huge kind of, um, you know, kind of safety net with people to kind of rely on as you were got to a point where you could be more open. And that gave you that kind of kind of group to kind of support you. What what role do you think support has? Obviously, it's played a huge part in your life, but has in relation to mental health or, you know, where are the real benefits of sport when it comes to mental health? Do you feel go having gone through it? For me, like th- there's for me with sport, there's numerous benefits. Obviously, you have that whole the, the physical benefits of it and the, the releasing of the endorphins and just being able to go out and enjoy it and mentally getting that fresh air, getting that break away from thinking all the time and like that's obviously we all know of of the benefits of physical activity but for me it has to be the the friends that I made because there were genuinely some days where I was calling up these these girls and it's two o'clock in the morning you know when I'm at my lowest and I'm calling because I didn't want to self-harm again you know and and they pick up the phone you know and there's Mm. not a lot of people who would do that you know and it kind of highlights the strength of those relationships that I had and that I formed and with those girls and with my teammates um, and you know that wasn't just a one-time thing it was a very much a numerous thing where I would call at random times during the day and I was very lucky that somebody always picked up the phone to me you know and was always willing to drop whatever they were doing and, and help me and that that really showed me they cared you know and that they that I was loved and I deserved that help and it, it was just such a boost for me to know that people wanted me around and that I wasn't, Mm. you know, and that like, I can't thank everybody enough for that. You know, and there's numerous people, they know who they are and I can never repay them for that. You know? Mm. Mm. Of course. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it is something I think that's overlooked with sport is the actual bond between players that you kind of almost put yourself because sport is so much a kind of a, put yourself in a position where you're on the front lines almost and you're 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 getting stuck in alongside colleagues there is a deeper bond than just any friend or something that you 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 have which which I think is something that has to be highlighted more but so from those experiences you you very clearly taken a very proactive role then regarding mental health and how you talk about it promote it you're very open about your own experiences which I think is huge from someone in your position with a profile um, tell me a bit more about what you do. I know you work with Pieta House and then there's this Tackle Your Feelings campaign. Do you want to explain to me a bit more about some of those things you've been doing kind of? Yeah, yeah. so like I I never I never planned to, you know, go out and tell the world my story and, and be this mental health advocate. It kind of just came one time we won the Six Nations in 2015 and a journalist was was writing a book about the women's team and the men's team um, because we both won that year. and. She was like asking me to recount my life. And then she was like, I have this gap here where, you know, nothing seems to have happened. And you weren't in college. And I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, and I I basically was like, you know, this is where I had struggles with my mental health, this, that, and the other. And she was like, do you mind if I put that in? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Like, it's part of me and it always will be. And so then from there, kind of, I gained a bit of media interest from that. And there were some articles and everything else. And I was praised for speaking out. And then I got a lot of contacts from just ordinary people saying, thank you for speaking out and kind of highlighting this. And from there, I was um, contacted by Pieta House. Um, and Pieta House are one of the um, services that I actually attended as a client when I was struggling with my my self-harm and they were unbelievable for not just me, but for giving some counseling to my family as well, because they had no idea what was going on. And so they asked me to be an ambassador a couple of years ago and just kind of help out with any um, events they were running and campaigns they had on. And I was only 
too happy to oblige and, and help them out because of all the support they had given me. And, you know, I'm very proud to be an, an ambassador for their charity. And, you know, they they were one of the, the people that are the groups that have helped save my life and put me in the position I am today. Um, mm. And then from that, the Tackle Your Feelings campaign came about. And that was um, set up by RPI, the Rugby Players Ireland. It's kind of like our representative group of the field. And they were setting up a mental health campaign, basically showing that just because rugby players are, you know, you see them on the telly or on the pitch and they're big, strong, um, men or women, you know, that they also have feelings too and they struggle just like everybody else. And so they asked me would I be involved in their campaign and I said yes. And so they, um, I'm no longer an ambassador for them because they change it up every few years. Um, but I kicked off that campaign to, I suppose, try and remove that stigma that's around um, mental health, particularly in Ireland. Um, and try and help people who are going through something similar to me um, kind of get over that or get through that or reach out and ask for help. Because for me, I didn't think, you know, I don't remember in school ever having a mental health week or having, you know, any mental health speakers come in and talk about their experiences. Mm-hmm. I'd never heard of, you know, the likes of Bodywise or Pieta House uh, until I was brought to them. Um, and I just think that, the earlier we get to people and teach resilience and remove that stigma around mental health, um, that the easier it will be for people when they face these problems to actually reach out and ask for help instead of mm. letting it fester and, and get worse like I did. Mm, mm. It, it, it is interesting, um, you know, hearing because I think I think it is it's kind of like seeing it, it, it's such a it's such a more serious topic now and you know covid obviously has made people much more aware of mental health not just for people struggling but mental health for everyone um mm-hmm. and i think that um we've even experienced it with the workshops we do with schools we've never had more schools on the phone to us because everyone seems to which is a little bit of a sad in in, in a sense that it's taken a serious world event to get people to just talk about a bit more and schools are obviously called to us because we need your workshops in our schools we want to do them more and, and it's great but it is still a thing of we need to probably be a bit ahead of it we can't wait for big events to sort of push this uh, uh, a little bit just on uh, you know you're in a position as a professional sports player a high level sports player um, and something that a lot of us mere mortals or sports people maybe don't get to experience but Obviously, you've talked about how this tackle your feelings is all about mental health and being more open. And, you know, sports players are kind of on this pedestal. They're big people, but they also have their own challenges. How is kind of sports psychology and mental health become a much bigger part of sports preparation, particularly at that level today than maybe it was when you started? Or have you seen it develop? Where does that fit into kind of sports preparation? Yeah, I definitely think because of uh, when you're obviously at international level, you're there is a lot more pressure to perform, um, mm. you know, than you would uh, particularly at club level, and um, and you know that can get to people. So there is that whole idea of having that build up of resilience and that mental prep to be able to, you know, I I completely agree that the game is not just about physical abilities. It's that mental ability, what happens, you know, when the other team go off and score a very much unexpected try and you know you've got to step up or you've missed a tackle um, and that has caused a try and how do you react to that and uh, yeah we definitely have had sports psychologists available to us um, and people do like to avail of them and, and mentally prepare and um, for kind of every scenario in games you know for me I used to be very negative um particularly in sevens, um, you know, for people who don't know sevens, there's an awful lot of space. Uh, and if you miss a tackle, it's more than likely they'll probably score a try. Like, you know, it, it's there's just way too much space out there that it, it's hard to recover from. And for me, I, I was so terrible for, we would be lining up in the tunnel waiting to run out and I would literally just be like, please don't miss a tackle, please don't miss a tackle, just make all your tackles. Like, And it's such a negative thing that I had in my head and so that I actually started to think back to whether it was training or games thinking back of all these really good tackles that I had made and you know they weren't big Mm -hmm. dumb tackles or whatever else but they were just good technique you got the player down you know it was a good outcome for your team and it was exactly what you wanted and so I had to really start 
instead of being like, don't miss a tackle, don't miss a tackle, start to really think about, remember that really good tackle you made that time and we got a turnover. Remember you hit it here and you did this and you didn't think about it. And th- like, that's only something really small. But for me, it was something I really had to work on because I was very much a glass half empty kind of, um, and, and it was always mm-hmm. looking at the negative things. And um, it's different for everybody. Some people take it to the point of, you know, have to wear the same socks and the same undershorts and have to listen to the same song three times in a row. You know, for me, it doesn't bother me what I listen to on game day. My routine is, it, it literally could be anything I often forget. Yeah. And I'm like, oh God, I haven't done this. Like, you know, but that mental kind of trying to imagine the scenario in my head, but of a good thing happening is something I I really believe in now. And it allows me to get a good head start on the game, you know, that I nearly mm. need first tackle already and don't have to worry about that. But it, it is different for everybody, but it's definitely crept into the game. And I think it's had a big impact on a lot of people. Some people don't care for it and that's, it is what it is, but other people really buy into that. And, you know, it's very much part of their routine and, and they've had a lot of success with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think sports is something that, for every sports person at every level, it, it, sports is a very tangible um, experience of winning and losing. You probably experience tangible failures and successes a lot more. It's harder probably in day-to-day life to see things, successes and failures, where sport is very out there. You win, you lose, you miss a tackle, you miss a score. So it's probably a lot more of a up and down kind of emotional roller coaster, you know, throughout games and things like that, that it is something that has to be a little bit more conscious of, I suppose. Yeah, look, definitely. And I think with us, the sport is full of highs and lows. Like you said, we all know that it's very much a roller coaster where you could be having a, a great, you know, first two games of a competition and you're flying high and then the last three don't go to plan. And, you know, it's all changed from there. And it is having that mental resilience that ability to be able to believe in your own performances believe in the team performances kind of the platform that you have built um and and i suppose the criteria you have around you that you know are good enough and in some ways not letting then the outside world get to you a little bit because you're so exposed you know Mm. to that like you look at rpi had a campaign recently about um surrounding the men's six nations campaign where a few select players, a winger with very long hair, um, was criticised quite a lot for some yeah. performances within the Six Nations. And a lot of um, unsavoury comments were left all over social media. And that can be very, very disheartening as a player. Mm. Whether, like, you know, I felt bad. And I was like, you know, I wasn't yeah. even playing. I don't actually even know him personally. But... As a player, you don't go out to make those decisions. You know, you don't go out to miss those tackles. Yes, you haven't done it correctly, but it's hard to remove yourself from that situation. And it's hard to not see those negative comments or hear what's going on. And, and like, you have to remember at the end of the day, we're all human and, and he has to go and review his performance and realize that he hasn't done what he set out to mm. achieve but also that doesn't mean he's a bad rugby player and that you know he should never play again and that mentally he should be in a very negative like light for the next few days or whatever yeah. over. it's kind of trying to be able to be like acknowledging that you made a mistake or you didn't make the right decision it's done and all you can do is try and improve on it for the next game and try not to do it differently and I, suppose, is, I suppose i suppose these are professionals like they know when they make a mistake, they don't need someone on Twitter to tell them. So exactly, it doesn't need to be compound, compounded by you know ten thousand people, you know, on Twitter telling them you should have made that tackle. You know, but it's hard. It's hard to pull yourself away from that. I've had it myself. You know, I I, I remember in the twenty seventeen World Cup. Um, I I was playing fullback. You know, I wasn't the kicker, but our ten had gone off, so I had to take this kick, and I. I absolutely sliced it. Like it was the most awful kick. I still have nightmares about it. But like there was a comment being like, you know, something around like, oh my God, my granny could have kicked it better. You know, something yeah. Yeah. like And at the time I was like, oh my God, I just want the world to swallow me up. Like, mm. you know, it was, it was awful. And I thought about it and I still am like, oh, but we know, I know. I kicked it. Like, you know, I know it was terrible. 
and I'm like, I'm fine with my friends and family being like, that was, did you mean to do that? Like, what? And I'm like, no, but I don't need the whole world to tell me. I already know. Yeah. You know, and it's hard. It, it is hard. But you got to brush it off and go, I, I know I'm a good player. I know I can hit that on my day and, and I'm going to go out and show them next time. Mm, mm. Otherwise, you yeah. just you lose your confidence and it, it affects you not just on the pitch, but off the pitch. It affects your whole demeanor and, and it's, it's not worth it. Yeah, and that's something I suppose us as sports fans have to be aware of when we decide to kind of give our two cents on someone's performance at the weekend. I'm the, look, I, I'm I'm one for shouting at the telly every weekend too. But would I put it on Twitter or would I, you know, put it up on social media for the world to see and for that player to see themselves? Absolutely not. Mm, mm. Okay, great. Uh, one last thing I just want to touch on, Hannah is. Do you see, as as a female and as a seriously successful sports player in uh, for various different female teams, do you do you feel a sense, or do women in sport f- feel a sense of responsibility, particularly at your level where you've had such success, to try and be a role model or open up kind of opportunities or encourage opportunities for young girls to get more into sport? I know it is improving hugely. Um, over most recent years but just where where does that come into kind of just your experience with sport I think and um, to be honest I don't think I have a choice in being a role model and I'm okay with that you know and mm. um, I'm out there representing my country and knowing that you know a lot of people a lot of young girls um, are sitting in the stands or watching on telly hoping one day they can emulate that and, and wear the green jersey as well but I think and it's not just on the international stage. You know, I think at club level, um, whether whatever sport you're playing, that you can be a role model uh, for those younger within your club. Because I think it's just to show that, like, if you put your mind to it, that you you can do anything. You know, and you might necessarily make that international level, but you can set out to be the best player that you physically can be, you know, reaching your potential. And, I I do understand I am a role model and um, and I would say that on and off the pitch you know I know that every time I wear the green jersey I'm I'm representing much more than just myself you know it's my family mm-hmm. it's, it's the whole country it's every little girl who ever picks up a rugby ball and wants to play and um, you know showing them that there is a route there and um, for them to I suppose follow in my footsteps and mm. off off the pitch it's the same you know I rep- I try to show myself as as someone who is respectful and you know who is friendly and outgoing and is happy to chat to anybody at all who who wants to to chat to me you know and it's much more than just showing that I'm a, a rugby player I'm a good person and you know friendly I'm outgoing and respectable and yeah, look, if everybody could be like that, that would be great. Um, you know, but yeah, I suppose it's just showing the world who I am and uh, showing people that there there are opportunities out there, particularly for young girls to to mm-hmm. follow in my footsteps and and be the best athlete in whatever sport that may be, you know. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, um Hannah, you've been more more than uh, generous with your time. Um and one last thing I just wanted to touch on before we closed was completely now away from some of those serious topics, just for yourself, both professionally and personally, what, what are you kind of looking forward to going into? Because I think the problem is no everyone keeps seeing the negative news and we need to just have a bit more positive outlook on what's to come. What 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 are you looking forward to? Oh, well, it's, look, it's been a difficult year for everybody. I suppose the biggest disappointment for me was that it, we were meant to have a World Cup this year in New Zealand at the end of 2021, uh, which has been postponed to 2022. So obviously that's something I'm looking forward to. It's just been pushed back a little bit. And mm-hmm. um, personally for me, I'm due to get married this year. So I'm um, really looking forward to that um, in August. Hopefully people can attend, fingers crossed, yeah, yeah. I suppose. Well, we, it, it was meant to be this Friday, but uh, we pushed back to August. So we're hoping for some some uh, uh, some good weather and some good company. And um, yeah, other than that, you know, it's just to, I suppose, stay fit and healthy and happy. And, you know, I've been very blessed so far with COVID that I haven't been um, affected too much other than matches being cancelled. So you know, that that's all I can ask for really is mm-hmm. that it continues in the same way. And 
see what the future holds. See what the future holds. That's it. Try and keep a positive outlook. So no, again, as I said, Hannah, super um, generous with your time. Really appreciate you sitting down. Yeah. I think a lot of people will get value out of not only your own struggles, but how you've dealt with it, how sport played a role. Because I think there is an element of sport that's kind of not really touched on when we think of sport. We think of the physical, not the mental benefits. Yeah. And then seeing how there isn't there, we have to be a bit more aware about how we talk about sports people and things like that, because there is that pressures um, that people go under. If people want to kind of keep track of you, your successes, where's the best place for people to keep uh, up to date on you? Is it online, social yeah, media? Probably my social media. So my Twitter and Instagram handle are both Hannah Tyrrell 21. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, no problem. We'll have all that in the show notes anyway for everyone. But um, yeah, like I said, if anyone has um, wants to learn more, go follow Hannah on social media. And um, yeah, feel free to kind of send us any questions you have in relation to this. Thanks again for your time, Hannah. And we'll speak to you soon. No worries, Owen. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. See ya.